okay, I've decided because of this lateness and all that, I will cut my fee in half. <laughs> I'm going to be bankrupt. <laughs> okay. Or I will multiply, I'll multiply it by 100. It'll be the same. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, we've been big fans of yours, like all of our teaching lives. So it's, it's oh, a shock. You're, you're saying just the right things. Good. Good this okay. Is Stephen, is it, is it possible you could lower your um, uh, your laptop net? Yeah. That's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there we go. I can sit up straight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to today's uh, Ninja Angora uh, show. Uh, we are really fortunate to have uh, Professor Stephen Krashen on, um, who's uh, one of the world's most eminent linguists. And uh, with half a century of work and research, uh, let me say something and interrupt you. I feel very much at home with you guys. I feel like we've known each other for minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a good start, I think. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, you kind of you kind of thrown us a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah, again, uh, welcome, welcome to uh, the Ninja Angora channel. Um, so it, if, if it's okay with you, can you, can you take it away? I'll take it away. What I'd like to do in the first, what, do I have five, six hours? That's what it'll need. That's fine, right? As long okay, as no, in the next, next 30 minutes or so. Um, I'd like to summarize the last 45 years. 45 years. I've been a scholar for 50 years. Can you imagine? That's amazing. And it's been amazing, and I'm expecting 50 more years, okay? Taking lots of vitamin E, vitamin C, and all that stuff. Um, I'd like to summarize the research quickly. I know that summaries are not always successful. If you already know the stuff, you don't need it. And if you don't know it, it's usually incomprehensible. But I'll try to just give the main points. Uh, I'm going to outline our theoretical work, and then, of course, do a little application, the usual thing. And the theoretical work begins with a very important set of vocabulary words, which I'm sure you guys have heard already, acquisition and learning. There are two ways to acquire a language. Um, conscious learning is still way ahead. Not very many people have heard about acquisition, and that's why I like to give these webinars. This is great. I'd like people to know that acquisition exists. I don't want to say you've got to use it because I say so, but experience it and see for yourself. The research is overwhelming. It says we pick up languages, we acquire languages. Uh, it's subconscious. While it's happening, we don't know it's happening. Once it's finished happening, we're not always aware that anything has happened. The brain is very good at language acquisition. It's not very good. In fact, it's pretty bad at language learning consciously learning things, et cetera, learning the grammar, um, et cetera. The research result that I think is the most important, how do we acquire language? Let me take a moment and give you a very quick language. I'll give you two language lessons. I'll give you a language that I'm sure you've heard sometime. Some of you may have studied. You tell me which of the two lessons you like better. Number one, wir werden jetzt anfangen, Deutsch zu lernen. Und ich möchte Ihnen voraus sagen, dass nach meiner Meinung Deutsch ist eine sehr schöne Sprache. Und ich hoffe, dass Sie sehr viel Erfolg mit Deutsch haben werden. Pretty good lesson, right? <laughs> if I kept talking to you like that, you think you'd pick up German? No. How about if I repeated it? How about if I said it louder? How about if I said it and then you said it? I know, I'll write it on the board, imaginary board. I'll erase every fifth word and you guess what the word is. None of those things work. None of those things have any effect at all. Here's lesson number two. Das ist meine Hand. Verstehen Sie das? Hand? Ja? Gut. Sagen Sie ja. Ja, verstehe. Gut. Das ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Und hier sind meine Ohren. Ich habe zwei Ohren. Eins, zwei. Zwei Ohren. Ja? Und hier sind meine Zigaretten, ja, meine Zigaretten. Ah, ich habe keine Zigaretten. Zigaretten sind nicht gut, ja. Zigaretten sind nicht. If you understood lesson number two, not every word 
but more or less, I did everything necessary to teach you German. Here it is, the most important concept I have learned about language acquisition. I didn't invent this, I wish I had. I get credit for it, but I didn't invent it, other people did. We acquire language when we understand it. I just gave you a German lesson. Like it or not, you all just acquired a little German. Language acquisition happens through comprehension, and it's easy. You can't stop it. This is wonderful. It's involuntary. Given a language lesson like the kind I gave you, you must acquire. You have absolutely no choice. Uh, I have to give credit to the others. A lot of people said this before I did. In the field of literacy, uh, Frank Smith, Kenneth Goodman said exactly that years before I worked, oh, Frank Smith, I read his book, Reading Without Nonsense, which I, happened, I just ran into at a bookstore. I read it in one sitting. This is in the 80s. And there was my whole theory right there. And it was so much better expressed than I did. It was beautiful. With different evidence coming from different directions. Amazing. Um, there was such a joy to see that. Kenneth Goodman had the same idea. He passed away last month, a real great loss of sort of the leader of the whole language field. So by the way, uh, this is all extremely important. I have to tell you all the details. I found out when I was staying at their house that Yetta Goodman, his wife, their family came from the same tiny little village in the Ukraine that my family came from. So Yetta and I uh, have concluded that we're cousins. Same theory, same idea, <laughs> criticized in the same footnote. It's wonderful. Now, in second language, a guy named Leonard Newmark knew about it, a professor at San Diego, and this is also mystical. I went to my Uncle Boris and Aunt Anne's wedding anniversary. You got to know all this stuff. It was their 50th at a local synagogue. I w Leonard Newmark, get it? I walked in the door, Uncle Boris Newmark, okay? And there was Leonard Newmark at the wedding party, at the anniversary party. Leonard, what are you doing here? Steve, what are you doing here? Well, this is my aunt and uncle's anniversary. No, it's my aunt and uncle's anniversary. My aunt Mary. <laughs> okay. So this is all very mystical, same theories, same idea, um, et cetera. So it was meant to be. This I the idea of comprehension has three amazing facts, and I told you one already. Number one, you can't stop it. It once you've acquired something, it it is there even if you don't want to. If you get comprehensible input, you acquire. Also amazing, <clears throat> and this Leonard pointed out in his work, my cousin Leonard, it happens best when the input is interesting. So people will pay attention to it. The job of the language teacher is to make things interesting and comprehensible. Those are the fundamental things. With a little more to say on that, but that's the fundamentals. We think now, third amazing fact, it has to be more than interesting. Even better, it has to be compelling. So interesting, <clears throat> you forget that you're listening to another language. Can I have some coffee? Come on, you're drinking it. Why can't I? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Secret of my success is coffee. That is another. I had my first cup, <clears throat> believe it or not, when I was 25 years old. I lost my coffee virginity when I was 25. It was in Ethiopia. I was teaching in the American Peace Corps. I came to school totally out of it. Um, an Egyptian teacher had her house on the compound. She invited us all for coffee. I had a double espresso, my first coffee ever. I woke up. <laughs> doesn't make me nervous. It makes me normal, okay? It was great. Why did it take you so long? Well, mom was a coffee drinker, my perfect mother. And in those days, we thought coffee was bad for you. So we all avoided it. We had said, gee, mom, you shouldn't be drinking this cup of coffee every morning. Um, before mom passed away, <clears throat> it felt so good, we had a big coffee party. I introduced her to Starbucks, okay? And I have vowed, vowed to honor my mother that I will drink every cup of coffee that she denied herself. 
Okay, so it's it's been really good since then. I wasn't a good student before that, and after that, everything seemed easy. Well, that is the basic theory. The basic theory says give people comprehensible input that is exciting, that is compelling. The ability to speak is the result of getting comprehensible input. More talking, more writing does not cause more language acquisition. I have to put in an important footnote about writing. And I'll be glad to give a separate seminar for you guys on this one because it's so exciting. Writing makes you smarter. It has cognitive impact. You write something down, you revise it, you revise it, and you see new connections all the time. Writers say that most of their work is revision. So this is it. This is the composing process. And I have learned that this is the most important thing to teach students. Okay, let's now get to pedagogy in general. Uh, and here I'm dependent on my own work, my own ideas, and the work of my colleague in Japan, Benico Mason, who's done really the real hard work in making this work for students teaching English in Japan for the last uh, 30 years or so. We have developed a hypothesis called the conduit hypothesis, the secret of success, make up terminology that nobody understands. <laughs> It's really worked for me. I plus one, nobody understands it, which means they all think I must be really smart, and they're not. The conduit hypothesis is perfect, okay, because nobody knows what I'm talking about, but it's really an easy idea. It go, there are universal stages. The earliest <clears throat> in each stage leads to the next. That's the conduit, and everybody goes through them, you guys have gone through them. If you're like me, you're in the middle of going through them with other languages all the time, which really is exciting. First stage, stories. Stories dominates this approach. In the last 10 years or so, I have learned to appreciate the incredible power of fiction. Fiction is the name of the game. The first stage we go through, stories, stories, stories. We hear stories from mommy and daddy. We get stories in school. Kids who hear more stories, do better in school. Stories give us everything. And stories leads to reading, of course. Kids who hear more stories want to hear, want to read books on their own. Uh, I, well, being middle class and growing up in a very privileged environment, people like me who have all these privileges need to tell people about it. They can't take credit for it. A famous football coach said, excuse me for speaking the language of American baseball, some people are born on third base and they spend their whole life thinking they hit a triple. No, <laughs> I was born on second base. I had every advantage. It was all given. I was born with books all around. Mommy and daddy were readers. The house was filled with books. My sister was a reader, still is. When I was nine years old, my sister took me to the local Chicago Public Library and got me a library card. That's the kind of environment I had. My father allowed me to read all the comic books I wanted to, and he said, I'll pay for them. This is great. That's the kind of advantage I had. Okay, we have to make sure we agree. Our job is to make sure every child has these advantages, okay? Second language, uh, Benico has invented a technique called story listening. In her class, in English as a foreign language, uh, she tells stories. She, she takes them from Grimm's fairy tales, which is great because these are things that have stood the, toast, toast, uh, the test of time. Everybody likes them, they're excellent, they're powerful, and we don't have to spend money on creating them, etc. They're free to download all this. When she prepares it in advance, when she thinks there's a word the students may not know, real interesting research coming up here, she then will draw a picture, maybe give a synonym in Japanese, maybe give more explanation. This is called having a prompter and, you know, giving them comprehension aiding supplementation. In one experiment, she did the work. I got the credit for it. I was co-author. It's a good way of working. Anyway, <laughs> what she did was we compared it with what happens when you give people, you supplement this with formal vocabulary exercises. We're always tempted to do that. She found that you're better off listening to another story. Mm -hmm. 
It's not as efficient as just listening. Vocabulary goes better when you just tell the story. Don't tell kids to memorize the words, write them down, listen to the story and enjoy. You get more words per minute than if you do vocabulary exercises or you combine them. So this is really a wonderful result. And the kids go on to read more. A former student of mine uh, wrote a paper with the best title ever. 15 books were taken home by the children. 14 were introduced by the teacher in class. It's the story that works. Well, that's the first stage. And it goes, it's the conduit to the second. The second is reading for pleasure. And here I need to just put in a word about the power of reading. More Incredible. Oh, I've been writing more short papers, even shorter lately. I wrote a paper called Why We Should All Write Short Papers. My last three papers are less than 500 words. And did I send you guys those three papers? If I didn't, I will. Okay. Please circulate them. The short, nobody has time for these long papers. They've got to be free. Otherwise, this is how we're going to reform the system, give things away like this. And you don't make money of these things anyway, so it doesn't matter. Only the publishers do. And the publishers need to find another way of making a living, as far as I'm concerned. They can't be parasites on us, especially now with limited budgets. One of the three papers I wrote in recent, since I've been in isolation here at home, I like it. I like being stuck here at home. It's kind of nice. I'm home all day with my girlfriend. We've only been married 53 years, so it's still <laughs> exciting. Okay. And I can do these webinars. I've been actually practicing the piano, which I haven't done in years. I play all the time. But now I'm actually you know, working on new things and, and all this stuff and pumping iron a little bit and working like mad, and it's great. The world is falling apart. And I'm really worried about this. It's falling apart economically and health-wise and all this stuff. But I must admit that every day is, is fun putting, these, uh, putting this stuff out. So we know that reading is the answer. That's stage two. Self-selected reading. Reading that you decide you want to read is really the only game in town. I have a colleague. We have a colleague named Donald and Miller who wrote a book called The Book Whisper, and I just love what she does. When, she, when a teacher is forced to work from a syllabus, and an outline, and here's what you have to cover, he's, here's how she marries the two ideas. Let's say the, the administration said you must cover biography in your literature class. Each student, this is the assignment, each student read three biographies. You decide which ones. So it could be anybody. It could be a biography of Justin Bieber, okay? All the great ideas are in three pages, okay? Uh, it could be a political figure. It could be a sports figure. The kids come into class, like 12-year-old kids, and they've read, the group has read like 50 biographies. And you can have wonderful discussions. They know what a biography is. Donald and Miller has pointed out that she requires students to read like 40 books in a, in a year, they read 50, they read 60, because they find out about this stuff. What we have learned from self-selected reading, it is the source of our literacy knowledge. It is the source of our vocabulary, our spelling. Are you listening, Donald Trump? No. It's the source of our I wrote a letter to the Washington Post about Donald Trump's spelling. I'll send you that too. They actually published it. Can you imagine? Uh, it's the source of our spelling. It's the source of our vocabulary. It's the source of our writing, our reading. And what people have found out, research in the last few years, it's a lot of our subject matter knowledge comes from reading fiction. Our knowledge of history, geography, our knowledge of just about everything comes from reading these books tell you a story about this. My cousin Evelyn is now 93 years old. Uh, we were, she was so wonderful to me when I was growing up. She lives in Chicago. I'm in LA, but we still stay in touch. And she was my mother's best friend. This is this perfect niece aunt relationship. So I honor my mother again by being, being buddies with Evelyn, which is very easy to do. Evelyn confessed to me lately that she always wanted to know more about law and how it worked. She was going to take a course on law. She's 93. She's going to take a course on law. 
And her late husband, Marty, who's a really good guy, had a degree in law, and she always envied that. And I said, don't take a class. Read John Grisham novels. <laughs> I've been sending her John Grisham novels, okay? Uh, the Runaway Jury, which I should have read before I did jury duty, all these things. And she tells me, we talk on the phone, she says, I know so much about law now. It is amazing, and the stories are so good. I have decided that 10 John Grisham novels is worth a year of law school. <laughs> she knows all the legal vocabulary. She knows how to file suit. She knows all these things. Fiction is where it's at. And I'm now beginning to appreciate it. So the second stage we want to move kids into is fiction, lots of, or self-selected reading, which could be absolutely anything. The best evidence I read for this was posted by Garrison Keillor, who's a radio personality and a humorist. And he says that since I was an English lit major in college, all my friends give me great literature as presents. Great books with a capital G, which I've never read. I walk by the shelf, you know, the Bronte sisters, Jane Austen. I walk by the shelf, and there are all these books staring down at me, making me feel guilty because I've never read them. So don't give people books as gifts. Uh, there's one exception to that for me, and I know you have an exception too. There's one person, when he tells me to read a book, I read it immediately. I can drop everything because he knows, and he's always right. He knows me better than I do, and that's my son. He says, try this one. Yeah, I do it. I do it, and he's always right. We occasionally have people like that in our lives, but in general, oh, don't. I asked my grandchildren, I said, you want books as presents? No, give me a gift certificate. I'll choose what I like. Take me to the bookstore, um, et cetera. self -shall I? Now, Benico has understood <clears throat> that for students of English as a second language, they're not always ready to plunge in, go to the library, select their own. This is really exciting what I'm about to tell you, as opposed to everything else I said. <laughs> what she has done is invent a stage called GSSR, Guided Self-Selected Reading, where the teacher helps them discover books, because she knows books and she knows them. Try this, try this, try this. And the books start out by being really easy. I'll tell you what happened to me in high school because it's the same thing that happened to you in secondary school. In high school, I took French. By the way, I got a passing grade in French by a very kind teacher. I was a terrible student under the condition that I never study French again in that school so he wouldn't look bad. <laughs> Today, my French is pretty good. Okay, it's not bad. But anyway, I, I do okay with French. And uh, I owe this guy. He said, I don't want to ruin your career, let you get into college. Here's what Benico, oh, let me review what happened in French. French is these very tough little reading passages, all designed to help you study the new vocabulary. And they're all about the Jean et Marie Dupont and their strange children and all that. And the first story is easy. The second one's harder. By the time you get to the fourth chapter, they're very hard because it's all the new vocabulary. Benico recommends extremely easy reading for kids, very gradually getting harder, mostly with what we call graded readers. And in English, there are lots of them. Every company has them, and people are starting to write them. Uh, colleagues of mine who work with story listening have a website where they're putting up their own graded readers. I wrote one. I have a story up, a story on the website. I'll tell you about it. I wrote it in Chinese. That's how good I am, okay? Yeah, Actually, it's my worst language, um, but I love it. It's so much fun. I have a good, I've had great teachers. Here's the typical beginner story. <clears throat> Serious problems, big problems. Donald Duck has three nephews. Where is their mother? Where is their father? We don't know. Goofy and Pluto. Goofy and Pluto are both dogs. Goofy can talk. Pluto can't talk. Why? They're both dogs. What's going on? That was the story. To keep it short and simple, so they can go on to the next one, to go on to the next one, etc. 
we have underestimated how long this period should be. What Benico does with her high school students in Japan, which she did, they do simple reading like this for two, sometimes three years. Wow. I've been applying this to my language adventures. You guys know this, and most of you listening know this. What you've got to do is be constantly you know, playing around with languages. It's really important. You learn things there that you could never get from the research. Uh, the one I'm working on now in my reading, well, I read for pleasure all the time in other languages. It's a good thing to do. You do that too. Um, I'm working on my Spanish. I'm making a special effort to read simple readers in Spanish. I could do this interview in Spanish. It wouldn't be that pretty, but I, I could do this. I'm okay. I can have conversations. It, I've never studied it. I've never lived in a Spanish-speaking country for longer than a few days. It comes from reading these easy books. I've started all over again. I've read one novel by Isabella Allende, who's, oh my goodness, is she good. Well, I read Zorro, where she pushes you on to the next one. But I've gone back to graded readers. I want to do 300 of them. That's what Benico represent, re recommends. And I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting, I know I'm getting better. I go to the supermarket Friday mornings at six in the morning because it's a special time for old people, which is nice because there's very few customers. And I always get the same guy when I check out. And I've got him to speak Spanish to me. He's Mexican-American. I do it by telling them, mi meta is hablar español como ustedes. My goal is to speak Spanish as well as you do. And then they talk to you. It's wonderful. And I can tell over the months, he's talking faster to me. He's using more complex vocabulary, which is a sign he thinks I'm getting better. And it doesn't matter how much I talk. I talk just for fun. I don't care. It's the reading that's doing it for me. No question. Same thing with you. I can go for two years without speaking German. And I'm fine. Because I'm still reading all the time. Once you got that little oral thing. So for us in school, and this is Benico's great discovery, all we need to do is story listening and guided self-selected reading. And our goal is accomplished. They can go on on their own. This is very, very exciting. So this is the implication. The implication is we want stories and we want kids to get into reading and our job is done mm. much easier. Uh, one research result, and then we'll go to the you know question and answer uh, with Benico's work. She, is, she had been teaching these, this group for uh, quite a while. She, uh, part of her load as a teacher in Japan was to offer a course for anyone in the community, great idea. And people would come in, all ages, age 20 to one guy, 76, I'd like to meet him, okay? And they got to read whatever they want. And some of them wanted Benico to help them find books, talk about it with them. So she said, fine, as long as you take alternate forms of the TOEIC examination, which is the big exam in Asia, uh, TOEIC score means everything. So they agreed, and then we could see how they're progressing. So we had all this data, they kept records of what they read, no, no big deal, and we asked them to do that, and then we did an analysis. Again, she did the work, I got the credit, my usual formula. We found that for every hour you read for pleasure, you gained one half point on the TOEIC, very consistent. In fact, there was hardly any important individual variation. To me, that means everybody's gifted in language. We can all do this if we get what we call optimal input. So this really, really works. The correlation between time spent reading and reading scores on the TOEIC was like 0.94. It was like super duper high. Oh, I, of course, being a statistics maniac, did multiple regressions, and we found, my son's a mathematician, so he and I go together. And, uh, we found that uh, all the other things they said they did study, all that didn't matter, didn't count in the regression. It's only the reading that counted. So that's one of several studies. I got to mention one more, a UK study done with native speakers. There's this group at the University of London that has been studying the same people since they were babies. 
the last report was when they were 42. I don't know how old the researchers were, but they, and this one, they gave them all a vocabulary test and a questionnaire. The biggest predictor of vocabulary scores, reading, reading, fiction. Highbrow and middlebrow fiction were more potent than nonfiction. Um, my responsibility is to criticize the American government, which is very easy these days, but I have to also criticize their educational policy. They had something called the Common Core, which was horrible, and it was based on nonfiction. Kids have to read serious. No, it turns out fiction is actually better for your intellectual development, better for absolutely everything. Uh, it all, they also found that it didn't matter how much the kids read when they were 15, the last time they tested them on this. It, it didn't matter what their scores were, didn't matter anything. It's what they were doing now at age 42. You can get better at any age. When I'm 42, I'm going to start reading. No, it's still even now. And I'll mention one more thing about this. My buddy, Steve Kaufman, who's a famous polyglot, you've heard of him by some good. Steve Kaufman is a righteous dude, as we say in American English. He is so interesting. He's been my, my therapist for language. His advice is so, so good. Anyway, he knows like 16, 17 languages, and he's good. I've heard him do these things. He's excellent. He has acquired eight of them since age 62. Isn't that inspirational? Yeah. So looking at you guys, you've got another 15 years to go, okay, till you're <laughs> hang in there, do the work, okay? <laughs> Let me pause now and ask all our friends out there if there are uh, any questions, or I'll ask you questions. No, I'll let you ask the questions. All right, or yeah. You, um, you mentioned earlier, um, uh, actually, you've just answered that because I was going to ask if it, if it applies at, at all ages, um, yeah. language acquisition. So it obviously does. Um, <clears throat> what's the biggest myth about language learning that you've come across? The biggest myth is that it's hard. It requires grim determination, Frank Smith's terminology. You've got to work really hard, and some people are better at it than others. And you can never acquire a second language to perfection. Not true. The only thing that happens to advanced second language acquirers is you may have a little accent. Mm -hmm. And to me, that marks the group you're a member of. Yeah. And even if you could drop it, we're playing with fire because you don't want to give up your group membership. Peter Ustinov says when he does a movie in French, he's perfect. But in regular conversation, he has a little accent. It's the group. Arnold Schwarzenegger is criticized for his English. Oh my yeah. God, English is fun. It's 50 times better than Donald Trump's. I mean, he's really good. He is really exceptional. Um, tiny little accent. And if you analyze it in phonetics, he has the tiniest trace of a German accent. He has acquired 98% of English phonology, okay, of the phonetic system. Yeah. So, I, so those are the big deals. Yeah, I, I read um, Arnold, Arnold's um, uh, autobiography, and it, his, his goal was to speak um with without an accent but i, I, th I think yeah well i'm going to send you the article we wrote about it. arnold where we were a student of mine and i i met arnold pumping iron on venice beach okay very nice guy oh i gotta say this about arnold extremely nice you'd be overdoing your bench presses as i know you do regularly arnold would come over say oh can i spot you can i help you oh try it this way and we'd always share with each other what arnold told us about lifting and all that super duper nice guy but he caused a lot of harm unknowingly i don't blame it because blame him because his intentions were good when he was governor he told hispanics stay away from spanish english is the way to get it and we know that's the um, building the first language really helps in second language. So my colleague, Francisco Ramos, and I wrote a paper about it. I'll send it to you, and you can, you can share that. And we'll share it with um, Have you got one, or can I do another one first? I have a question yeah. about assessment. So where do you see the role of assessment in all of this? <laughs> <laughs> Number one, there's no reason to assess speaking. Let's get rid of that. It's the hardest to do, and it's derivative of the others anyway. It's very hard to do integrated reliability. It freaks people out. Let's just drop it. We should also seriously consider not assessing writing. Our writing style comes from reading. They're always highly correlated. And the goal of writing 
is to write what you want to write, a problem that you need to solve. Someone says, read what you like, write when you must. And you learn about revision. Learn that that's the way you get smarter, um, et cetera. So that's half of it right there. I would do the least amount of assessment that does the job. The best assessment, as we know, is teacher evaluation. Uh, we know the latest results on college admission, uh, what criteria universities use to you know, bring in new students. We know that uh, test scores are not very powerful. When you add grades to the battery of test scores, the test scores don't matter. It's the evaluation of a trained professional who has been with the kids day in, day out, rather than a standardized test written in a room in isolation by someone who has never spent a day alone in a room with 10-year-old kids, okay, or any kids. So I go with teacher evaluation as the most valid and best predictor of students. And we're with these kids all day long. We know them, et cetera. Right. Yeah, I think as well that, <clears throat> excuse me, that raises another point as well about um, uh, assignments, you know, submitted assignments. Because the, uh, the problem we have at the moment with essay mills, um, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, you know, I get um, people pumping, sure, pumping me yeah. to, you know, pass on my service to your students. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's disgraceful, really. Um, but again, th that, that would sort of negate um, this issue. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you get extra credit, young man. Very good. That's true. It is absolutely true. Uh, not only that, the, I read reports that China is developing computer programs that will grade your compositions for you, for teachers. Reduce teachers' work. In other words, fire teachers. We don't need them so much. That's the real motivation, I think. No. That's the last thing we need. We shouldn't be doing that stuff in the first place. Mm -hmm. There is very good research on error correction and grading. The best studies that I know show that it has no effect. How do you like that? What works is when we do things that stimulate students to read more, self-select reading more. That's what we want. Yeah, I think you find as well, because the, the, the assignments that, that we give feedback on and we pass them back to the, to the students, they'll make the same mistake because they haven't heard the feedback. Right. I like feedback, etc. I'll tell you what I did as a college teacher when I taught classes in the old days. Um, say, if you take my class on language acquisition, three essays, right. maximum length, three pages. Okay. Infinite revisions allowed. Mm. If I didn't like it, you can go back and write it again. And usually it took two or three, even for the most you know, stubborn students, until they came around <laughs> to my view, no, until they you know, <laughs> supported their points. Take a point that's about you, related to the literature, and talk about it. They liked it. I liked it. And, you know, one class I had like 40 students. And th three pages, though, is nothing. They didn't hand them in all the same time. And you like reading them because it's all about their reaction to the work and it's their own case history. So this, I think, stimulates thinking it's what we really want to do. So I like reacting, but I didn't correct their errors. It didn't matter. I pushed them back into the literature to defend their points. Like they would say, well, error correction, uh, I don't know if it helps you. Well, try reading so-and-so's article. And then they read more and their style got better. Mm. Now, something, uh, this is a little bit of a sort of uh, a long one, if you like, but say for example, if, if, um, if you gave a, a baseball result that was wrong, uh, okay, not, not you know, the, the royal you here, or the royal we, if, um, if we gave a baseball result that was wrong and someone corrected us, we'd go, oh yeah, okay, sorry about that, yeah, I understand. And then if you gave a football result that was wrong or you spelled someone's name or mispronounced the name wrong, then you'd be correct and you'd be fine. What is it with grammar? When you correct someone's grammar and you're called a grammar Nazi and all these horrible things. Now, you're not a big fan of I think the, the Guardian just had a column on this. I, I was going to respond if I had time, I didn't have time. The Guardian had this whole thing, should you correct people's errors when they speak? Okay. And nobody, this is my job to do it, but I had too much going on uh, to talk about it. <laughs> nobody mentioned that it doesn't work. It simply doesn't. There's good reasons why. Error correction 
impacts conscious learning, not acquisition. So if you say, you know, just between you and me, uh, and all it should be just between you and I, you're supposed to think, oh yeah, uh, I'm sorry, if you say just between you and I, that's wrong, should be just between you and me because it's objective case. They'll start thinking about grammar. They'll correct themselves. They'll learn the rule better. No, most grammar rules are results. You know, we make things like that. Language is changing and we're fighting against language change, which is tough. Or the rule is too complicated. Nobody understands it anyway. And to apply conscious rules to your output is very hard to do, especially writing, because you, then you lose track of what you're doing. So I would shove it off to the corner. I would have a little bit of editing, not much. But basically, in conversation, it's a disaster. You'll never be able to say anything. Oh, I had a great experience in Mexico I'd like to share with you because I get to quote Steve Kaufman again. Um, I spent a week in a language school in Cuernavaca with uh, the staff, faculty and staff, and they had a conference which I spoke at. And I stayed at their home. Their house and the language school were in the same thing. The classroom was there. And I ate meals with them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. These are all language teachers. So we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, and we basically had wonderful conversations. We gossiped the whole time. Who was it? Alice Roosevelt, who said, if you don't have something good to say about someone, sit next to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one of the problems with Spanish is the verb to be. There's two forms, ser and estar. One is permanent, one is temporary, etc. I know the rules, but I have not acquired it because it's late acquired. I'm not that good. You can't avoid it. So I decided having lunch and dinner and breakfast with these teachers, they teach this stuff. I'm going to forget about it. I'm going to come, I'm going to say whatever pops into my mind. It made all the difference. Nobody corrected me. They didn't care. Kaufman points this out, paper on polyglots, which I'll also send you. Don't worry about it. Nobody cares. People are not evaluating you. When you they're interested in what you're saying, not how you're saying it. And that made breakfast, lunch, and dinner a lot of fun. And I'm sure my Spanish probably got better because I was getting more input. So it's a problem. This correction thing can really, really hurt. And as you say, it's one of the obsessions we have. Mm. Too bad. Growing pains. Yeah, I'd have to try and let go of that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving a little bit away from uh, second language acquisition, uh, I have a question for the teachers listening. What about research? Where do you see the future of research heading? Uh, and especially for higher te ed teachers, we are so pressured to, um, our research output has to be really high. And yes, I know that. Um, and I think that's true. I think for university level, it is our obligation Okay. to produce research. And I believe in publication. Publication is how we pay people back for what they've done for us. It's absolutely necessary. Uh, in fact, I think it's our holy mission. You go to a party and you meet a young man who's a researcher and he says, well, I'm working on pancreatic cancer. Well, and your cousin just died of pancreatic cancer. You really feel deeply about this. He says, how, how's it going? Well, we've got some great results. We know how to do it. Is the research going to come out? Oh, no, I'm not into this ego thing. I'm just doing it because I like it and it's fun. No, you, you have a right to be outraged. I feel the same about research in language acquisition and language teaching. However, what we're doing now, we're making it impossible. It's because articles are too long and too expensive. I had my breakthrough mm, 15 years ago. A book came out called Input Matters, a little play on word. And I was invited to do an article. And I had a long, good time with it. It was a huge article. I don't write long papers anymore, but I did then. I put everything in the paper. I even talked about how will aliens be treated when they come? Can we acquire their life? whole thing about abduction? How do they speak in animal language? This comprehensible input. I had a good time. Book came out, hardcover, $160 American. You have an article in that book, it is doomed to oblivion. They can, I, they've told me this. You sell it to university libraries. They have to buy it. And if it's very expensive, they'll do okay. 
a company will make money that is nasty, awful, unconscionable. So, and the same thing with journals. I can no longer afford professional journals. They're too expensive. I have a membership only in a few local organizations where the membership's like $20 a year that I can afford. But the others, two, $300, I can't do it. The articles are too long and they're mostly incomprehensible. They're mostly full of jar jargon and gibberish. Uh, people are publishing their dissertations because they want prestige because they're pressured to do so. So my point of view now, I can afford this because I'm retired and I don't get reviewed. Short articles, three pages, two pages. Uh, I have not reviewed an article for a journal in the last five years because I told them I will only review articles five pages or less and they're all much longer. So why bother, okay? I can't get through them. Short papers publish in open access journals, free to the writer, free to the reader. That's what I do now. I put them on my website and I advertise them on Twitter, which I love. And I have joined ResearchGate, which is free, which will put your articles there. More and more people are doing this. My former student colleague whose work is wonderful, Jeff McQuillan is doing it. Follow him on Twitter, you'll find his stuff. Uh, Benico Mason is doing it. All these people whose work I depend on because we do work together. Um, we're, and eventually, it'll get some respect in the university and reviewers should understand this makes life easy. You're reviewing a candidate with this many publications, you can't get through it. And you can't review someone if you haven't read their publications. But if they're all two pages, you can do it in a couple of days. Um, one of my favorite papers appeared in the journal Nature. And it was the discovery of the double helix. Uh, Crick and Watson. Probably the most cited and most important paper in the history of science. One and a half pages. That was it. They didn't have a long introduction because they figured if you need a long introduction, you shouldn't be reading the paper. They didn't have a long conclusion, a long sermon, how you should spend the next 20 years of your life, you know, to get this right. You don't have to show off, show people you're reading. The conclusion was something like, it has not escaped our notice that this might be interesting in the study of blah, blah, blah. That's it. That's all you need. So we need to change. As I've said before, the publishers need to find an honest way of making a living. They can't do it through this. We have started it. It's spreading. Other countries are doing it. A famous a mathematician from the UK who won the Fields Medal for his work in algebraic geometry has rebelled. He is doing it. Uh, a colleague of mine in India got a big article in the Hindu Times. This was so cool about open access. And he mentioned my name, of course, because we're buddies. And he edits an open access journal. Okay. So I would push in that direction, it's inevitable. The field has to do it. So let's do it and save all our junior scholars so they can get tenure, they can keep their employment and continue doing work. The value of writing when you write things up academically is when you write up the results and the analysis. That's when you're learning new things. We don't want to spend our time on long, boring summaries of the research and sermons to other researchers. So I'm positive about the future if we can continue doing this. What's the backwash effect of that on the academic writing that we teach at university level? Because if we want to be headed towards that, and we do teach academic writing at universities, so um, do you see that changing, the format of that changing? Should you caught me on this one. Let me tell you, I had never thought about this, but I'll give an answer anyway. Uh, usually I can only answer questions that I've written about, <laughs> okay, I've thought it through. I haven't thought about that. That's a wonderful, how do we teach these courses? Well, you're not going to teach it by assigning John Swale's work, the work on discourse, which is fabulous linguistics. It's great discourse linguistics. I admire it, but it's not going to tell you how to do academic writing. Mm -hmm. I would, if I were doing a course like that, I would ask students, to continue reading in the own area of interest okay. massively. That's how you acquire the style. And I would ask people to read my two very short papers on avoiding gibberish and why we should write short articles. That's really it. 
And then the, you don't have to teach it. They'll acquire it. If you've read 200 short papers, which is a couple of months, you can do it. Absolutely. I had a year at UCLA, which uh, when I was in the PhD program, which I'm, I'm very positive about my experience is absolutely marvelous, but not this part. This is studying for the qualifying exams. I had to do a year of reading in my specialty, which was psycholinguistics. I had to master all of it, and I read huge amounts of stuff on areas I was not doing research in. I don't remember any of it. Mm. Nothing. It's gone. What I should have done, and my chairs basically helped me do this, he said, go do your own thing. Go find, don't go to this meeting, Steve. You don't need this. Go back and do your own work. They were the ones that pushed me toward being narrow. If you're narrow, and you read in your area, your interests will grow naturally. Yeah. You'll wind up reading far more than you thought you should because you get interested, and then it will be there forever. Yeah. yeah. It's happened to you. Yeah. yeah um, okay, you've probably been asked this a million and one times, um, but we haven't asked you. So um, post-COVID, um, what's the future of the classroom? Uh, future of the classroom, I'll only talk about a short part of it that I've actually thought about and I'm trying to write about. I was on a panel. What about language teaching under COVID? Yeah. It's the kind of thing we have now, a face in front of you. Mm -hmm. Ironically, it's going to be good <laughs> because you can't do the things that don't work and you can do the things that work. Go back to Benico Mason's program. You can tell stories. How about that? You can't do error correction that doesn't work anyway. You can't do comprehension checking, which is a big mistake. Uh, Benico and I did a paper on this. Uh, comprehension checking all too often means you stop telling the story and you ask students, did you understand? What did this word mean? Uh, can you translate the sentence that disrupts the story and raises anxiety? So all these things that we, oh, and you can't do interaction. Oh my, when you're telling a story, you don't need all that interaction. If the story is too hard, the student can interrupt. And if the student has choices, they can change the station. <laughs> Go to the easier story. Gee, I, I'm watching this great show on television. Oh no, I don't like it anymore, but I have to see the end of it. No, you don't have to. We can, if we have 50 beginning stories, that kids can choose from. They can choose the topic, they can choose the level, and if it's too hard, they don't like it, it's offensive to them or whatever, they can shut it off, Go to, as we do channel hopping all the time. So the future in language teaching is glorious, I think. Mm. Yeah. Lesson hopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Uh, any, any other questions? Not no. Me, no. So, uh, so can we um, already ask you if we can have a session on academic writing next? <laughs> yes, I'd like to do that. And I'll tell you why I like it so much. What I do in this session is I talk about other people's research, not mine. Right. And I, I love honoring it because it has helped me so much. The whole idea of the composing process, all this stuff, uh, start by Janet Emig, Peter Elbow has been a giant. I have had great experiences with Peter Elbow and helping me understand these things. We actually spoke at the same conference once and I was able to thank him wow. for all this work that has helped me enormously. So I like talking about it and how it's helped me. If there's time, I'll talk about the academic composing process. <laughs> What to do about rejection. Right, yeah. Submitting, resubmitting. Okay. I, I see you're worried about this. Let me talk to you, my dear. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we're all, I'm talking to you too, buddy, because we're all worried about it. Yeah. So let me have a brief comment on rejection. Everybody gets rejected, nobody talks about it. Hmm. I recommend a book called Rotten Rejection. Okay. which is all about famous people who've been rejected and their comments on it. My favorite comment is this poet who says, I don't know what I did to these people that made them so angry, but whatever it was, I wish I'd done it harder. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. It's full of comments like this. Everybody gets rejection. And 
everything I've done has been a constant rejection all the time. I just keep going. Okay. What I do is, first of all, you deal with it right away, immediately, the same day. Drop everything. Otherwise, it's going to tear you up from the inside. The rejections, that the comments that you like, pay attention. The ones you don't like, forget it. If there are too many, for, go to another journal. A wonderful study was published, and it's, it's in all my records. I can't remember. CC was the first author. They took articles that appeared in top psychology journals, and they changed the author, and they resubmitted them. <laughs> Eight out of 12 were rejected. Oh. Wow. On methodological grounds, mostly. Is uh, our reviewers arbitrary? Yes. But what I've learned is that if you hang in there, it will get accepted somewhere. Yeah. That's what I have seen. Hang in there. Keep doing it. Look at open access. Let, let me make a compromise with open access. I know you've got to publish in the prestigious journals, which are usually really boring. But take another version and do part of it for an open access journal. Do us a favor so we can read it. Mm -hmm. And also, here's the major thing. If it's in a big journal and it's expensive, get it published in ResearchGate. They'll, they'll put it in there. These people are so virtuous. What a service. And make a shorter version, parts of it. So that's the way out until the war is over. This is what I think. But do it right away. Get it done. Then go public. try to publish somewhere else if it looks like there's... I got, I'll tell you my latest story. The article I wrote on polyglots, where I quoted Steve and uh, Lom Kato from uh, Hungary, my met actually, and what they said about things, I thought was one of the best papers I'd ever done. I gave it as a keynote at the polyglot conference. Gosh, was that exciting. All these polyglots around. They're all very nice people. I think it's one of the reasons they succeeded so well. I sent it to, I won't mention the name of the journal, Foreign Language Annals. They, the reviewer just went, drove me nuts with, oh, change this, change that. Finally, she said, one reviewer said, what about all these places where Krashen has obviously been wrong? He's got to defend himself. I wrote back and said, I already have. Well, you've got to mention it. No, this paper is not about that stuff. They get to see that roadblock. I withdrew the paper. So I consider that a rejection from a top journal where it would have gotten lots and lots of play, and I published it somewhere else. Don't concede to get your article published. You are responsible for what's in the article. If you give in to a reviewer who is wrong, you can't say, oh, the reviewer made me do that. You will be blamed. It's going to hurt you, and it's going to hurt the profession. Go to another journal. Go to another journal. There are plenty of them out there. Well, yeah. So. Really good now, at the, at the Polyglot Convention, what, which language did you speak, or did you speak lots of them? Well, it, well yeah, I gave my talk in English, which was the official <laughs> language. But at dinner, of course, we all got together. And he says, "No English at the table." <laughs> it loosens things up. So I was doing fine, you know. I, I took, I, I stayed with French, German, and Spanish. I have to admit, took the easy way out. Okay, but these people. They, they're so proud of each other. You should hear this guy speak Lithuanian. <laughs> you know? He's wonderful, okay? You should hear this guy speak Hindi. He's fantastic. You know, they were proud of each other's achievements, which was the best part. So there were languages informally going all the time. But I did present in English. I could have done it in French or German, even Spanish, but it was a lot easier this way. And that was the language most of them understood. It was the lingua franca. Yeah. Now, with, with Chinese, it's much more difficult to, to read, obviously, because it, they're, they're, they're symbols. It's, you know, they're, it's a hansa, isn't it? The, uh... Yes. Oh, God, I'll tell you what happened with that. I did get an article published in Foreign Language Annals in defense of pinyin, which is using, using the alphabet. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and here and there's bitter debates. Here's my opinion on the basis of, say, a year exposure <laughs> to Mandarin, which means, you know, I get very, I, I'm not very good. I've had 
conversations and you know it's i i really want to get better and i'll tell you why i haven't gotten better there's no input i cannot get input and i'm i'm not off the topic now i want stories there aren't that many stories a uh, few of our people with Benico are now starting to get interested in doing this in, in uh, Putonghua, in Mandarin. And there's nothing to read in Pinyin. Mm. There's a no novels uh, by a couple of people. My teacher, Haiyan Lu, is writing really interesting stories about uh, cats and now goats. She's expanding out. And, you know, little things. I wrote two booklets with Linda Lee, my first teacher, and we had a wonderful teacher. We had a great time with them. They're too expensive. Mm. They cost like eight dollars. You know, who can afford this stuff? And they're cute stories and I like them and all that. But there's not much out there. And in uh, the the things I've read that are designed for beginners are much too hard. Much too hard. You need, like Benico says, super easy. So I'm not that good in Mandarin because there's nothing to read. We're better off with the romanization. Mm. Here's my logic. If you get the language down through romanization much faster than struggling with, the, with this, you will acquire the language more. Mm. Reading with Hansi, reading with the characters will be easier because we learn to read by understanding what's on the page. A quick theory of, of reading. And this is Frank Smith and Ken Goodman talking. We understand in general, and this is print and everything, by number one, making predictions. This is analysis by synthesis. We make a prediction on what's going to come next. So we're less dependent on the signal. For example, in the sentence I am now speaking, you know exactly what the last word is going to be. And Frank has written beautifully on this. He says, we're predicting all day long. And, that's, and we're rarely wrong, which is why we're so rarely surprised. Yeah. Okay. You move into a, go into a hotel, which we used to do in the old days. You know you're going to get a key. You know the room is going to have a bathroom. You know it's going to have a closet. You don't know where they're going to be, but you don't have to learn all that stuff uh, from the beginning. Okay? So it helps you get through the day. When your prediction is correct, that means you've understood. And you don't need much of the signal to do that. So if I start reading in Hansi, and I start reading, if I can make correct predictions, I'm going to pick it up faster. Right. And that comes from knowing the language. Mm. And I'm getting that through reading in Pinyin. Mm. I'm going to read a lot more books in Pinyin if I can. Mm. I've tried to learn the symbols, uh, the characters. I've picked up about 40, 50. It's hard. Mm. I got man and woman down pretty well because I go to bathrooms and Japanese and Chinese restaurants. And I mean, there it is, okay. Uh, but the others, the, the street signs, et cetera, little by little. But you've got to get it in reading. You've got to get it in reading. So we need lots more easy, easy pinion in the service of someday getting the characters. When children learn to read, they can learn to read using the characters because they know the language. It's their first language. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, I think if we get a few questions on this session, can we have another one about academic writing and start off with you answering those questions? Would, would that be That's okay? fine. Yeah. And as soon as we're offline, I'll take out my calendar. Yeah. And we'll go back and forth. Real. Thank I mean, you. I really like talking about that stuff. So I told you. It's All right. Very good. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and, and learning. Oh, it's been great. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. Really is. It's, Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just give you bodybuilding wisdom which I got from all the big guys on the beach. It's more important to look good than feel good. <laughs> <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> Fernando Lama said that on national television, and he meant it on the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> okay, gang. Okay. Thank you Thank so, so much. much. Thank you. Okay, keep up the good work, and you'll hear from me on the little screen. Brilliant, Fabulous. thank you. Fabulous. Okay. Bye-bye now.